Hello, everybody. Welcome here today. It is a beautiful day to be together. So glad to welcome you to Peace Portal Church this morning. If this happens to be one of the first times that you've ever been here, welcome. And uh, for those of you who are regular with the rest of us, welcome back. This is a day to praise God together. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, the Bible says. It is good to give praise to his name, to proclaim his love in the morning and his faithfulness at night, meaning his love and faithfulness. As the, as the world continues to spin around and around and around, we can sing his love and his faithfulness. It's always true. We get to declare the wonderful character of God today and do that together in community. So God bless you as you join us in worship. Would you please stand and let's lift up the praises of the Most High God. Let's declare him um, as faithful.
on this Advent morning, we want to continue to worship and declare that all are welcome. And I don't know what you've walked in here with this morning, but we want to invite all of you, whether you're feeling very joyful or whether you've been walking a hard week, uh, let's uh, worship and join our voices in Come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come, all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us, we never believed in you, we live forever. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions. He so loved the world that he would step into the darkness, coming as the one and only true light. And so we are going to read from John chapter 1, 14 verses. That's a big chunk of scripture. And I uh, want you to hear the tone of love, the tone of um, desire to connect with us and meet with us. In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things that were made, without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, 
and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was, the, was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Would you read these last verses together with us? The word became, became flesh and made his dwelling among, among us. us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. These verses we've just read about talk about this true light stepping into the darkness. Jesus came to bring his kingdom, a kingdom that's characterized by true hope in the midst of despair a kingdom that was characterized by true peace in the midst of conflict. And this is our hope this Advent, that Christ isn't far off. We just hope we can like hold on to him. No, it's like we are walking down life, this tunnel, and this, this light is what is to orient us. It's what is to keep us going day after day in our journey on those hard days, on those good days, that his light would orient us. And as we sing this next song, I've just been thinking like our only response to him coming and stepping into the hard parts of our world, our only response can be, thank you and God, I worship you. And so I would just love as a church if we sing this song with thanks in our heart and a response of true worship because he has stepped into our world and he has brought hope. He longs to bring you his hope, his joy, his peace that nobody or nothing can rob from you. So let's worship him, church, this morning. Let's ask him for eyes to behold him afresh and anew this morning because I need it. We need it. In light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see the beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. So here I am.
this morning again would you tell him Jesus you are my hope Jesus you are what I need in this season more than being busy with lots of social plans more than checking off a really busy Christmas to-do list we need you God we want you we want you to orient this season for us want you to come and have your way with us. We want to meet with you each day because you are beautiful. You satisfy us like nothing else. Let's see, here I am to worship. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to stay. pray together. We do adore you, Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who came in flesh to become one of us, to rescue us, to redeem us, to set us free, to break chains, to invite us into your holiness and your wholeness. We praise you that you are our strength and our deliverer. We thank you for fulfilling your promise, God, which was awaited for centuries, and then you arrived. Thank you that you keep your word. Thank you that you are loving and faithful. And we thank you as well by faith that you promise your next and your permanent return and how we long for that, Lord. We so long for that, for the time when you will make all things renewed. In the meanwhile, in this in-between time, we thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence with us, for the birth of the church, for the fact that we can be together and unite and learn from one another and grow and encourage and see the gifts that you have liberally poured out onto your church used in loving and faithful ways as well. We pray for your grace, Lord, that you would enable us to stand in the light and to be the light, even as you are the light for us. Shine on our darkness, Lord. Shine through our darkness. 
We pray for extra grace, Lord, for people who are suffering in this season, who are confused, who are lonely. Would you have mercy on them, Lord? Renew their hope. Remind them of your love and your faithfulness, even as they face brokenness on a daily basis. Thank you, God, that we can come to you and ask for forgiveness for our sins and redemption from you and life and lightness of being. Jesus, you said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And so, Lord, we seek rest in you today. Would you teach us your holy ways so that for our part we would align to your good and your pleasing and your perfect will. Prepare our own hearts, Lord, in this Christmas time to receive you in new ways and enable us as a church to also help others by clearly living and presenting your good news to such a hurting world. Shine through our darkness, we pray, Lord. Guide our feet in the path of your peace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. As you have a seat, please greet one another. And kids, you can be dismissed to kids. And then please turn your attention to the screen for an announcement. Over the last number of years, we have partnered with a local pastor in the Middle East who is faithfully shepherding and leading followers of Jesus in that region. As a small and quite vulnerable group, the church is unable to generate the necessary funds to fully support their pastor. And so the first 10,000 of this offering will go to pay for the pastor's housing over the next year so that he can continue to give leadership to the church and reach out in their area. The additional 5,000 will support the work of Ben and Rachel from Peace Portal supporting and running programs for those displaced and in refugee camps. Join us in supporting this local pastor and the work happening within camps in that region as they seek to shine the light of Christ brightly. Thankful that we don't do that alone. Thankful that we do that in the power of His Spirit. We do it alongside brothers and sisters of multiple different backgrounds and alongside brothers and sisters there in Canada like UP Portal. So, Thank you for continuing to support us. Thank you for being involved in the ways that you are. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Exciting to partner with uh, Ben and Rachel, who are from our church and living over there. And we are in a real intentional season of giving. And so we invite you to participate in this, in our Advent giveaway. You might be interested to know just along the way how we're doing with our Advent giveaways. Last week was our first one for Alpha Canada. We're nearly at that goal of $15,000. So we encourage you to continue to um, support these ministries that we are part of together during this Christmas season. We have ambitious goals, and they're, they're on purpose. They're, they're financially ambitious. We, for our church, for this uh, month, we are hoping to receive $400,000. And that's no joke. It's a lot of money. Um, and, but we are doing that on purpose so that we can be set up well, not only to give uh, healthily to ministries like this, but also to set us up well for the new year. And we're so excited for what God has been doing among us, and we invite you to participate with us in that. Thank you. A couple of reminders. Today, uh, for those who have been participating in our Christmas hamper program, the hampers are due today. And so if you've forgotten, uh, you can come back to church quickly after church, but you can bring your hampers into the gym, and they'll be collected and organized there. Also, if you would like to catch up with the rest of uh, the people who've been doing the Advent Refresh Guide, we still have some available at the Welcome Center, and you can follow along up, up until Christmas Eve itself. Another thing that we're really excited about, I just mentioned Alpha that we're, that we're supporting. We are planning to offer a whole new Alpha course on starting January the 15th. And so I invite you to be thinking about and praying about 
if you would t attend and bring along another friend who is also exploring and wanting to discover more about Jesus. We're really excited about this. We, we are hoping to have a wonderful class, and so that's January the 15th. Please be praying, who could you invite? And, and uh, I invite you not to be shy about it. Be bold. This is great news. Good news of great joy, right? And so we love to share this with one another. Finally, just a reminder for you, our Christmas Eve service, we love our Christmas Eve services here in the community, and we have four of them this year. And so they're going to be at 2, 4, 6, and 9 o'clock. And again, think about uh, which neighbors and friends that you could also be bringing along for that great day of hope and joy. And now at this time, Jesse is going to lead us in our Advent reading. Thank you, Jesse. Advent is a time of expectant waiting as we prepare our hearts for the arrival of Christ's birth. As we make our way through December, we are reading through the four different songs in the Gospel of Luke that celebrates the promise of the Messiah and his eventual arrival in the birth of Jesus. Today, we are reading Zechariah's song from Luke 1, 67 to 79. John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hates us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. The oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. The Song of Zechariah. Good morning. Oh, it's trying. It's lit. Good to be with you this morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Jesse. Thank you for doing that. Um, it is great to be here. Um, so we've already heard the song that we're going to be looking at, but we're going to kind of dive in. We're in this series about songs of the season. And I think music is such a powerful tool. Uh, I think some of you, many of you have been gifted with it. I've been a part of this church since 1998. Not once have I been asked to sing on a Sunday. So you can clearly tell that song is not the gift that I've been given. Um, and uh, I'm really thankful for people that God has blessed with that, the ability to write music, be able to worship in that way. Amy is a wonderful example of someone who responds in song. In our staff meetings, when we're reflecting on what God's doing in our lives, Amy's often one that will respond uh, just in a spontaneous song about what God's doing. And it's a beautiful gift to be a part of. So when we open up the scriptures this morning and we read Zechariah, responding in song for you to imagine that it's actually not that far off from what we experience today, is that there are still people who, with us who, who, uh, whose love of Jesus overflows in, regularly in song. And so we're in this season of anticipation and my job at this church, my role is I'm the youth pastor. And so I'm finding that it is getting more difficult with time to help young people especially understand what waiting is. And so they live in a world, they've grown up in a world, I think about my own kids, of Amazon, instant downloads, overnight worldwide delivery. And I sometimes tell our students stories about when I once on a Friday night, me and my friends would go to Blockbuster or Rogers Video, and we would hope that the movie that we wanted to watch was available. And they, of course, would say, sure, Grandpa, all right, grab a seat, you're going to be fine. And so they are like, they just can't even believe these stories. They're so inspired by my stories of going to Blockbuster Video. Um, and uh, I remember last year I read at Christmas time the famous Canadian Christmas book called The, the Hockey Sweater. And if you're not familiar with it, it's a story about a boy uh, who asks for a Montreal Canadiens jersey for Christmas and his mom uh, sends away for it. So she finds the catalog, puts in the order for him, sends it away. And to his shock, what shows up but a Toronto Maple Leafs jersey. And so 
Well, if you read this story to a kid under 10, you know what they're most shocked by? What website did they order it off of, Dad? And how did they get it wrong? And so they just can't even imagine a world where you had to fill out a card and send it away. And weeks later, like, they, they, my son Jack just could not believe the process. He was, more, he was not caught up with the jersey. He thought it was an injustice that it couldn't get something the next day. And, you know, we, in, this t- in our time, there's not a lot we wait for, right? But I think this weekend particularly, there's a group of people, quite a few of them, that have been waiting for about 395 days uh, for something called the Eras Tour to roll into Vancouver. And uh, th- there is something like 185,000 people that will be at BC Place this weekend. My wife was one of them. And um, there's people that have been waiting a long time for this experience. But I think for most of us, There's not a lot of things that generationally we wait for. The Messiah was something hundreds, like centuries and centuries and centuries, lifetimes past. The only thing that we have that we've been waiting generations for is something we're not looking forward to. It's that earthquake they keep telling us that's going to ruin all of our stuff. So I don't know if you grew up, I've I've grown up being instilled in the fear of the big one that allegedly is coming towards us. And so um, I hope that the Lord allows us to wait even longer. I'm happy to wait many a lifetime for this gigantic earthquake to come. Um, But we don't wait for a lot. And so I think when we read a story about waiting for things and longing for things, it's often, I think, really hard and getting increasingly difficult for people to even wrap their mind around a world that they have to wait for anything. And there's a discipline that comes with it. There's a faithfulness that comes with it. And so when we read Zechariah's song and we read Luke 1, um, I think we have to put ourselves into the mind frame of a world where you waited for a lot of things. And the things that he was waiting for were worth waiting for. In this case, having a baby. So in Luke 1, uh, Zechariah, we introduced to Zechariah and Elizabeth, the couple that longed for a child, but thought that ship had sailed. They both uh, had resigned to the fact that it just wasn't going to happen. Um, And in Luke 1, Lord changes all of that as Elizabeth finds herself not only pregnant, but pregnant with the one that that Jesus himself describes in Matthew 11, 11 as, Among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is the least in the kingdom, uh, kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And so it's this picture that John the Baptist, until Jesus is going to arrive very shortly after, is the greatest person ever born. He is the one. He is a big deal. And so now, um, Zechariah and Elizabeth are going to give birth to the most infl- the forerunner to Jesus, perhaps the, the second most important person uh, in Christianity, John the Baptist. And he says, the text is going to dive, and we're going to dive in today, is a beautiful image of God's fulfillment of his promise. And uh, the second part of it is Zechariah's response to God's faithfulness. And I think for each of us, there, I think there's something that we can each uh, glean from this. As I prepared, I was thinking about all the ways that God has been faithful to me in big things and small things. And actually, God's blessing to Zechariah, I don't want uh, to spoil it yet, but it was really rooted in Zechariah following a real, one simple command that he was given. It, wasn't, it, it was something that he followed that God asked him to do, that as a result, God blessed him. So let's get into it. So uh, this is, we're going to dive into, I'm going to read you the verses uh, leading up to uh, what was read already. Here's Here's where it is. This is in the book of Luke, chapter 1, verses 57 through 65. When it was time for Elizabeth's baby to be born, she gave birth to a son. And when the neighbors and relatives heard the Lord had been very merciful to her, everyone rejoiced with her. And when the baby was eight days old... They all, came, uh, they all came for the circumcision ceremony and they wanted, uh, they wanted to name him Zechariah after his father. But Elizabeth said, no, his name is John. What, they exclaimed? There's no one in your family by that name. They used gestures to ask Zechariah, because remember at this point, Zechariah is mute. He can't speak. So they're trying to like get him to affirm that the Zechariah is the name this baby should be named, not John. Um, and they motioned with, and then John, or sorry, Zechariah motions for a writing tablet. And to everyone's surprise, he writes, his name is John. And instantly Zechariah could speak again. And he began praising God. All fell upon the whole neighborhood, and the news of what happened spread throughout the Judean hills. Everyone who heard about it reflected on these events and asked, What will this child turn out to be? For the hand of the Lord was surely upon him. Zechariah says, No, his name is John. Because previously in the chapter 4, the angel Gabriel said, That is what the baby is to be named. And he pushes against the social convention, says that's going to be the baby's name, and immediately he can speak. And I don't know about you. 
if God had taken away my ability to speak for several months, I am not totally sure my first words would be a song, but maybe my first words would have been like, God, we need to talk. And I might be like a little bit frustrated. My humanness would shine through. I'd be like, what was that all about? But instead, Zechariah immediately breaks out into a song. And so uh, there's a couple things going on here. Number one, so uh, we have a couple that's expecting the unexpected and Zechariah is unable to speak, but their joy is shared in the community. Because in verse 58, it says, her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy and shared her joy. I mean, this is the embodiment of what we read in Romans 12, that we rejoice with those that rejoice. That this person that had longed for her whole life to become a mother was now not, a, not only a mother, but going to give birth to this John the Baptist. And that the community and friends around her rejoiced with her. If she had Facebook, she probably would have posted about it. She would have been real excited. But the people that were really close to her were thrilled for her and they were rejoicing with her. And this is, yeah, the act of living out of Romans 12. And I hope for each of you that you have someone in your life that when something awesome happens, when something amazing happens, when you get a cool opportunity, you get a promotion, something that you've been praying about, something you've been longing for comes to fruition, that your kid gets a good report card, someone that you could pick up the phone and rejoice with them, that they would be excited for you, that it wouldn't be, there wouldn't be jealousy, frustration, there would be just genuine joy for you. And I love that for Elizabeth and Zechariah, they had people around them, their neighbors and relatives heard what the Lord had shown them great mercy and shared her joy, that there are people in your life. Find those people that will share your joy with you. Find those people that on those mountaintop moments wanna join you up there they want to be there with you because they're the same people that are going to join you in the valley, right? They're the people that are going to walk with you when things are difficult. And so it continues. It says, when the baby was eight days old, um, they all came for the circumcision ceremony, but they wanted him to name Zechariah. And we talked about this. So the cultural pressures on Elizabeth and Zechariah were very real. The cultural expectation was that Zechariah's son would be named Zechariah. You would give it a family name. And so it if, if there's cultural norms that you are falling, finding yourself into, and I think if, if you grow up in the church, especially if you work in a church, there's some expectations when you have your own kids that you're going to give them biblical names. I think sometimes they're like some people surprised when you don't. And there's amazing names to choose from. You might name your son John. You might name your son Luke. You might name your, da your daughter Sarah. You might name your son Ham after one of Noah's sons. Not enough people are naming their kids Ham. Um, <laughs> You might be like, hey, you don't want a cool baby name that no one's using? Nebuchadnezzar. You know, everyone's little baby Nebby. Everyone's really happy to see little baby Nebby. And maybe you're, maybe you're someone that's like, hey, I'm going to give my son the same name as, I don't know, say share a middle name as like Walt Disney because you think it's important. He's an important figure in modern history who spent his life creating beautiful spaces and people to create and spend their time in. And so that might be you. And for me, I was like, I, I feel compelled that for my son, that my desire is for him to know Jesus, but my desire is also for him to live out a life of creativity and beauty for the sake of other. And so I kind of felt like Levon and I had to choose to break from social convention and say, actually, we're going to give our child a name that speaks to the gifts and the things that we would long for our son to live into. And so uh, I just want to say that for these two, there, it was a lot for them to do it, but it was actually simply just what God had asked of them to do that. And despite social norms, we learned that the angel Gabriel had visited them earlier, this is in chapter one, and clearly told them to name their son John. Zechariah, who is still mute, overhearing the suggestion of a different name, demanded something to write on, and he says, no, the baby's name is gonna be John. And immediately after saying that, his voice came back. And God's faithfulness, faithfulness to God will sometimes require us to go against social norms. And I think about all the places and spaces that I find myself, and I know you find yourself too. There's pressures for us to do things the way that other people are doing them. There's pressures for us to align our resources, the way we spend our time, the way we allocate our free time, all of these things. There's ways that society would say we should. And for us to break from those things in favor of leaning into what God has for us or leaning into where he's leading us can often feel costly, but actually it was Zechariah's obedience that leads him to his voice being restored. And his first response is to praise God. But it continues with this. It says, Awe fell on the whole neighborhood, and the news of what had happened spread through the Judean hills. Everyone who heard it about it had reflected on these events and asked, What will this child turn out to be? For the hand of the Lord was surely upon him in a special way. This is an interesting verse because it actually gives a little bit of insight 
into even maybe a little bit of doubt that existed. Because everyone's been hearing about the Savior that's come in. Everyone's now hearing, people are starting to hear about this John the Baptist that's going to be born, this one that is going to come. But it is all of a sudden when they experience a miracle right in front of their eyes of Zechariah getting his voice back, beginning to praise God, that what do they say? They, they're, everyone heard and reflected on these events, but they said that um, news spread, what will this child turn out to be? Awe fell over the neighborhood. What will this ch- child turn out to be? It got real in that moment. Like all of a sudden, these promises that they're told, these events that, that, that for centuries have been told are gonna happen are beginning to unfold in front of their eyes and awe fell on the whole neighborhood. What will this child turn out to be? And these are the moments when life gets real. What is John the Baptist gonna be like? And it's easy for us on this side of history to open up the scriptures, to go and study what happened and be like, well, of course he was like this. Imagine being in that moment with the entire future unknown to be like, oh man, what is about to happen? So what does Zechariah do? He sings a song. And this is contained in the verses 67 to 79 of Luke 1. So we have this picture of this, these, the verses. It's, they call it the Benedictus. Zechariah is filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's an important detail because he praises God for his faithfulness to Israel. Um, and Zechariah is prophesying here. So he is speaking God's words. He is empowered by the Spirit and empowered to share God's revelation to his people. The Benedictus is a prophetic song of thanksgiving and of praise. That uh, Zechariah, is, Zechariah is here and he's like, his response um, to these moments is to sing this beautiful song. And this song is broken up into a couple important sections. Um, and so here's what it goes through. Uh, it's already been read, but I want to read it one more time. Then the father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and gave this prophecy. Praise the Lord God of Israel because he has visited and redeemed his people. He has sent us a mighty savior. Um, so I, I like to read from the NLT. I teach students from this, this verse because I find that it's written in a language that's easier to understand. Um, but the one that was read all earlier said, uh, it talked about, what, what, Jesse, where'd you go? Oh, she's gone. Um, the, there's different versions that describe uh, this verse slightly differently. And so I find this one's one of the easiest one to understand. Um, so he has sent us a mighty savior from the royal line of his servant David, just as he promised. And through his holy, uh, his holy prophets long ago, now we will be saved from our enemies and from those who hate us. He has been merciful to our ancestors and remembering his sacred covenant, the covenant he swore with an oath to our ancestor Abraham. We have been rescued from our enemies. This is a song that he's singing that is talking about Jesus, that is talking about his son who's gonna be born, Uh, And it's just so beautiful. And he's talking about what is going to happen next. And you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High because you will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins because of God's tender mercy. The morning light of heaven is about to break upon us to give uh, light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death and in the shadow of death and guide us to a path of peace. One, let's start with what he's talking about. It talks that, his, that God visits his people, right? Um, in verse 68, praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he visited and redeemed his people. God's visiting his people. It's a strange word here, but what it's trying to get to is that if I go to visit you at your house, right? The, the word that it comes from is actually more about seeing you than anything. It's vi- like the word vision. Visit and vision are closely connected. So God visits his people. God sees his people. But we also get God visiting his people, sending the angel to speak to Elizabeth. We have him being there. But soon what we're going to have is God visiting everyone in the person of Jesus arriving uh, on earth. And so we have this picture that up until now God was visiting his people. Um, And he was actively involved in their lives then as he is 2,000 years in the future now. God visited Zechariah and Elizabeth and was about to visit all of his people with the birth of Jesus. Number two, God provides for his people. He redeemed his people. God at great cost saved his people and he delivered his people from Egypt in the physical sense. But also there's a spiritual spiritual freedom that is about to come to people. There's a spiritual restoration that is gonna come that because of this Jesus that is going to come that we can stand in right standing with the Father. In, uh, it's, it continues in verse 69. He has sent us a mighty savior from the royal line of his servant David, just as he promised through his, the holy prophets long ago. This guy, this person of Jesus has been promised for centuries that he would come. And the specifics about the prophecy in this text reinforce the generation of texts that come before it, predicting the details of Jesus' arrival. 
So then it continues. Now we'll be safe from our enemies and from all who hate us. He's been merciful to our ancestors. And so to understand that, I, I think we probably living in North America don't have a lot of context for physical enemies. We live a pretty safe life. I think we're pretty comfortable here. We're very comfortable here. Um, but to understand that the listeners to this would have been people that would have, in the very physical sense, known enemies. They would have known different groups, um, the Roman government, the Philistines, and others that were constantly trying to oppose God's people. There was personal enemies. Each person to a, that might have, on a very personal level, as they're actively trying to live out their faith to follow in Jesus, there's people that are trying to oppose them in their walk, trying to oppose them in their beliefs, that they have people that would oppose them in that way. But of course, there's spiritual forces at play here. Death, sin, and the enemy. Uh, who are against God's people. And so he, it says, now we have been saved from our enemies and all who hate us. He's been merciful to our ancestors. So what does he talk about here? Um, he's talking about that Jesus in, is the fulfillment of the covenant that God made with Abraham. But we have Zechariah continue, he reminds us that God is al- has always and will always keep the promises. And he references the covenant that God made with Abraham way back in Genesis and promised, and which in that covenant, he promised him land. He promised him descendants more numerable than the stars. And he promised him a blessing and redemption and a promise that would come true as Jesus arrived. That God's promises for thousands of years are all culminating in the person of Jesus. And so Zechariah is trying to prepare us for this reality that this Jesus guy is gonna come do all the things that, we've, that for centuries people have lived and died and lived and died and their kids, 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 kids have been anticipating the Savior that's coming. And now in this moment, his arrival is imminent and Zechariah is trying to remind them of that. And so now what about John the Baptist's role? And you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High because you will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell his people how to find salvation through that. And John will prepare the way for the Lord by calling people into repentance and salvation. So he's gonna go ahead and say that the Lord is coming and he will be the forerunner for Jesus. And John the Baptist, like many prophets before him, are gonna call people to repentance. He's gonna make it known that he's on his way. Ahead of the divine intervention in this, case, in this case and the arrival of Jesus. But for each of us, God can use each and every single one of us as the primer, as the preparer for the work that God wants to do. That in so many ways, in the places and spaces that you go, you are the first interaction that people have with Jesus. You're the first sermon that they hear. You are the first scripture that they're ever going to hear. And not necessarily in the words that you say, in the way that you act. You are a forerunner for Jesus, whether you know it or not. And that you are going to give traction to the things that the Bible says and the things that God wants to do. And people are going to meet Jesus through you before they probably ever meet him in person. Whether it's walking him into the church, inviting him into your home, being hospitable, being generous whatever it happens to be. I think about our youth ministry and we have had so many new students this year, but it's amazing that they come in, a lot of them come in totally blind to who the person of Jesus is and not understanding it, but then they meet leaders that are invested in them. They're meeting um, other students that already know Jesus that are committed to our program and wanting to tell their friends about it. And it's in that, that people have this encounter. So we think about John the Baptist as the forerunner. I think we can look at that and say, that's a role that I could play too. That's, and obviously to a very different extent, but it can be on a very personal one-on-one level that I actually am empowered every day to reflect the love of Jesus to people. Every single day I'm empowered to do that. And I, I, it's a choice though. It's a choice that we make every single morning. And God can use you to do similar things. Um, continuing, verses 78 and 79, it says this. Let's keep going. Um, uh, because of God's tender mercy, the morning light of heaven is about to break upon us. I think this is an important thing for us to hear. Because of the tender mercy of God. Mercy is something that we are given that we don't deserve, right? And so when we talk about the tender mercy of God, the Jesus coming, offering his, de- his own life for us, offering, God offering his greatest possession, his one and only son for us, was not a result of our works, not a result of our appeasing or people-pleasing of God, not of us being good enough, generous enough. There's not anything that our hands or feet could create that would entice God more to love us and to do what he did for us. In fact, God's God's tender mercy, it's only God's tender mercy that we can be be forgiven. It's not about us doing more. And I think at this time of year, and I've, I've been prone to this too, 
is there's just striving to do that. My uh, love language, one of my love languages is acts of service. So I sometimes feel like I just want to like serve God into the kingdom. I want to make him like me more. I want to do more things. I want to just get in the good books. I want to get score some more points. Whatever that goes through my head that even as someone that's followed Jesus for a long time, it's still in there. Is that, but it's not about doing more. It's not about what I do. It's about what he did and accepting, uh, accepting what has already been done for us. And it says this, God's mercy is like the rising sun, bringing light, in, brought light to those in darkness and guiding us into peace. And I don't know for you, I, I know that Christmas is first, it's such a mixed time of year for people. You know, growing up, my parents divorced when I was young. And so Christmas was more complicated than I would ever want for my own kids figuring out whose house I was going to go to. Um, you add in a layer of complexity that my, my, I, my mom remarried and I have a wonderful stepdad. He's awesome. Um, and uh, his parents were divorced. So growing up, I had four sets of grandparents. Cha-ching, am I right? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Birthdays were all right. Birthdays were all right. But other than that, complicated, <laughs> difficult. But it, it was, you know, Christmas morning getting up and, Going to, your dad, going to my dad's house and then getting driven to my mom's house and going to see these, these family members and those family members. It was, it was complicated. And Christmas for some reminds us of loss, marital breakdown. It reminds us of our own maybe traumatic childhood around the holidays. I mean, Christmas isn't universally a positive experience for people. It's stressful. It's expensive. Uh, I think the point of it gets often missed. And so I think we, we come into this Advent season recognizing there's a level of complexity here. There's people who are having the best time of their life. They're just thriving. And there's other people that are really struggling. Um, people that are in seasons, or they feel that their seasons are dark, hopeless. They're full of pain. People have recently suffered loss. Like there's a multitude of experiences of the same season in this room. I just want to encourage you after the service, there's going to be people down front that would love to pray with you. And if you would like to have that conversation, we would love just to be able to um, ask God for his help with you and um, pray with you. There's lots of people here that want to do that. And so, uh, and maybe, yeah, you feel like you're living in darkness and there's parts of your life though, maybe that just feel like they're lurking in the shadows, hidden from the world. And you need to bring that to light and confess God, to confess it to God and seek his mercy. Here's what I know. It says that he is a mighty savior. He has sent us a mighty savior. And to me, I, I, I just know from my own experience of God that he is so kind, offers his forgiveness to you, to me, when we're so bold to ask. Jesus is the ultimate source of hope, light, and peace in our lives. The band is gonna start coming back up in just a sec here. Um, they can come on up. Uh, but if you hear anything, if you hear me say anything today as we look at Zechariah's song, one, would you hear that God's promises are sure and his timing is perfect? And that there's things that we long for that God is gonna have us wait for. And in a world where we don't wait for much, that can be really, really hard. And um, our lives, like Zechariah and John's, are meant to point people to Jesus. We're ambassadors of Christ. The first sermon your friends are gonna hear is you and how you live your life. And the opportunity we have every single day is to give thanks to God. And if you're like my friend Amy, it might be a song that you sing. And it could just be words. It could be a journal entry. It could be a prayer on your way uh, to wherever you're heading. For me, I often pray for my, I pray for my kids after I drop them off at school, um, that they would have a great day. And I just thank God for, even in the midst of the stress of trying to convince two people to eat food and put on clothes, um, that I love them so much and I'm really thankful for the opportunity to be their dad. Um, and my questions are this, where do you need to trust God's promises in your life? And what's something that you're waiting for that you just need to surrender to him? And uh, yeah, I'm gonna pray for us and we're gonna worship together and we're gonna respond. And we have a chance together. Um, I didn't say this earlier, but there's something really special about church. This is really, Short of singing like the anthem at a Canucks game, this is one of the few places that all the generations sing together anymore, right? Is that we, we stand, we sing, and um, there's something really beautiful about it, is that we come from a multitude of places um, and spaces, but we uh, have just this desire to glorify God through our worship. And so this morning, as we stand back up to worship, uh, I just wanted just us to think about Zechariah.
and him honoring God's faithfulness by responding in song. But there's something beautiful and unique about the church is that the generations will sing together, that young and old will gather in one place with a shared set of values and a desire to know Jesus more or learn more about him. But in the midst of that, that we would get to sing together. And it's really beautiful. So uh, I'm gonna pray and we're gonna sing. Lord, thanks so much. God, as we uh, gather this morning as your church, that this would not be rote or routine, uh, but actually be, God, just a gift that we can be together. It's not lost on us that in this room are people of all ages, but God, we're shared in our curiosity of you, our desire to know you. Um, and some of the people in this room have known you for a long time, and some are just asking good questions. And God, we're really thankful that all of us can be under this roof together worshiping you. And so God, as we sing, would we be impacted by your beauty, but the beauty that we're together, that is the gathered church and the body. God, that you're present here and you hear our song. And God, would, you, uh, would it be a sweet song, God, that you hear this morning? We pray this in your name. Amen. Would you stand with us and worship? You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you bring hope, you restore every You give life, you give life, you are. 
First again, you give life, you are love, you bring light to the dark. Sing that again. You give life, you are love, yes you are. You bring light to the dark. Sing it again. You give life, you are love, you bring light to Amen. Yeah, prepare to go. Uh, my, my prayer for each of us is that in the next seven days before we get together, that you would have a sweet moment where you get to respond to God's faithfulness. It might be a song. It might be something, a, a note you write, a journal entry, whatever it happens to be. But would you, um, would God open your eyes to the work that he's doing in your life and invite you into responding with thanksgiving and praise uh, this week. And may God go with you as you endure a week of preparing for Christmas. I hope it's sweet and great and full of beautiful memories with friends and family. God be with you. If you'd like to pray, uh, there are going to be people down at the front that would love to pray with you. Have a great week.